Greetings and welcome to the Mount Rushmore podcast. My name is Jeff and I'm joined as always by my good buddies, Richard. Hello. And Michael. Howdy. Richard and Michael love to come back together uh, in locked in Mortal Kombat like um, Freddy versus Jason or horror character versus other horror character. But uh, this episode, they're not competing against each other. They're competing against Don Pogue Gearlings, the proprietor of ClassicHorrorShop.com. How are you doing, Don? Hello. I am good. Thanks for having me. We are uh, really ecstatic that you're on the show because we love Halloween. We love all kind of things uh, spooky and related to like films and and entertainment. And uh, we want to kick things off early and support a cool business uh, that does a lot of its revenue around Halloween, and that is Classic Horror Shop. Can you tell us about your uh, ClassicHorrorShop.com? So it's different, you know, collectibles and costumes, apparel. I just started kind of focusing a little bit more on dresses and scarves and things like that because the horror community is um, very male-dominated, and so... I've started to try and get some different types of things in the store to gear more towards the female side, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, so yeah, I have different apparel and um, props, things, all different kinds of stuff. I've tried really hard to get a good variety of different kinds of products. And um, it's only been a year. I started it in July last year, just because I have some disability and mobility issues and I kind of wanted to set myself up with something that I could do from my home. And um, I love horror. And so it made sense. And here we are a year later. (laughs) Well, that's super awesome. Uh, We salute you as uh, being an entrepreneur and we at the Mount Rushmore podcast uh, like to uh, support small businesses uh, that are, will soon be turning into large businesses because uh, it seems like every year Halloween and horror gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but we do invite uh, the viewer to go to classichorrorshop.com. And if you spend $25 uh, or more, of course, you can use the code MR2020, as in Mount Rushmore, MR2020 for 10% off through November 1st. This won't be a very plug-heavy show. I'm promising that this is going to be about the topic which we have chosen, which I haven't even introduced yet, and that is a new classic uh, horror characters, the Mount Rushmore thereof, new classic horror characters. But we want to just jump in and support a uh, small business person such as Dawn, who is trying to keep a business afloat in this really challenging time. And I want also uh, reiterate, I'm looking at the site right now and, oh my God, these dresses are super cute. Like if you look no, at them right. from a, like back, you don't necessarily know that that's mm-hmm. like a, a, a Jaws uh, cute uh, swing dress or like a Universal Monsters head of swing dress. They're just super cute. And then you get up on close on them and you see Beetlejuice or you see um, uh, the, the close up, the stuff in there. And there's also like uh, fun bloody bath and body products. That's a lot of fun. Tell me yep. about those. They smell amazing. And I uh, sort of roped in one of my other disabled friends and she makes them for me. So it's supporting her as well. Um, so I try to support people that I know and other small businesses, especially because of COVID. All of our trade shows got canceled, which sucks. So, you know, I'm trying to help other people when I can. There have been some virtual trade shows, but, you know... Being at those shows in person with the horror community is so much fun. I mean, it's challenging as a vendor, but it's all worth it because of the conversations and the people and the horror community is amazing. I love doing those shows. So they're definitely very missed. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, it's all horror all the time, all year round at classichorrorshop.com. And we're going to get away from the plugging, 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 and get into the conversation. And so, Don, how things work here on Not Rushmore Podcast is you're going to make a choice as to your first choice, and then they're going to choose their first, second, second, third, third, fourth, fourth, and we'll go uh, till the end and see who wins. So uh, the topic is the Mount... Pardon me? 
Is there a quiz? You didn't tell me that part. No quiz. No, 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 no oh, quiz. Good. You just okay. you just tell <laughs> us uh, uh, your choices. So <laughs> we'll start with the first choice of the new classic horror character, and which is it, Dawn? It is Wednesday Adams. Oh wow, that's a great. Right? That's, that's awesome. That's an awesome choice. Yeah. Why did you I choose Wednesday? Love her because she's a little creep like me. And, <laughs> you know, she wears all black like me. She is pale like me. She hates summer and summer camp like me. Um, not a fan of the Girl Scouts. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Just her overall attitude. She she's amazing. And Christina Ricci. I mean, come on. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. Even just her expressions, like when she lights up Pugsley in the first one, <laughs> uh -huh. just her right. little expression, like she's amazing. That character is so good. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. She's I think there's also there's also an implication that though she might not be a serial killer yet, she is. She's just, you know, she's doing all the homework. She's, she's on her get, way. <laughs> she's on her way. She's studying to be the the serial killer of the um, you know, the next century. Yeah. I love it. Not That's that a I, sponge. Sorry, not that I love serial killers, but you know, <laughs> in the movies, I love serial killers. <laughs> I love that you came out uh, with a uh, unmale character because it seems like uh, like in life, <laughs> cinema uh, tends to portray the uh, guys who are usually the people causing chaos and murder and people. But uh, Wednesday has even within this uh, family that she's part of that is very odd and um different she's even kind of more different than them uh it seems like um uh gomez has such a joie de vivre for life um that it's uh she she almost has to be in a state of permanent eye roll with her <laughs> crazy yeah. family too. she never gets out of like that serial killer mode yeah, <laughs> she's she... just always <laughs> lasered in there <laughs> yeah. cool choice done all right guys what do you got all right, so our first choice is Freddy Krueger. Oh, awesome. Cool. I was looking at, we were looking at some of the most iconic new horror characters. Mm -hmm. And just by number of films created, <laughs> if we're yeah. talking about sheer volume, yeah. Freddy Krueger has to be on there. Um, you know, and I think Freddy Krueger for me, there's like two distinct Freddy Kruegers. Mm -hmm. There's the Freddy Krueger from the original Nightmare on Elm Street, and then there's the Freddy Krueger from any other Nightmare on Elm Street that Wes Craven did not direct. Oh, okay. Um, and I think the one that most people remember is the second one, mm -hmm. where Freddy Krueger was kind of this wisecracking, almost like a, you know, you could picture, you know, a direct line between him and Deadpool. Ah, oh, that's a, that's it's a almost like an, like an evil version of dead of Deadpool, uh -huh. which is not how the first Nightmare on Elm Street is. He is a frightening child molester, come to life, you know, stuck in the stuck in dreamscapes where he can kill people, mm -hmm. and there's no one-liners. He taunts people before he kills them, but it is not meant to be funny. Mm -hmm. um, now. Okay, there's a bathtub scene that's pretty funny, and there's a tongue coming through a receiver that's kind of, <laughs> kind of slasher version of funny. Yeah, there's yeah. it's yeah it's a Wes Craven film. So yeah. I was you know I was unrelated or semi-related. I was watching uh, Poltergeist with my uh, daughter last weekend, and I had forgotten just how funny Poltergeist was. Like, oh yeah, it's, it's a yeah. very funny movie. I mean, obviously it's very scary, and there's certain scenes that, you know, made me question if showing it to my 13 year old was the right idea or not, <laughs> but we, we plowed through and yeah. And so Wes Craven definitely has that undercurrent of comedic release mm -hmm. with the tension that is being created by the horror. Yeah. It's certainly something like, like a Sam Raimi or someone like that. You can tell kind of studied under his, you know, learned mm -hmm. from that. Mm-hmm. I think also he feels like, or at least the, the character as designed, feels like them, something that has extended from, like the original universal horror monsters were very much um, built upon makeup and looking visually so striking, be it, you know, uh, the Frankenstein's monster or the mummy or who, you know, the wolfman, that you see someone like 
um, Freddy and is he's just burned and scarred and just very iconic looking with like all like his three elements, like the hat and the sweater and the gloves and the face, I guess four elements, but like all of those kind of like they pull into something where some more classic horror monsters are very. And I think any, probably any of the people that we talk about, there's something very iconic looking about them. There's something so distinct. This is why they stand out. They're not just, you know, um, you know, a guy in a sheet or I don't, I don't know what, but, I think Freddie does that. He there's something visceral about seeing like someone that's burned up and and I uh, think and, and I some... and I think the way that he kills his 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 prey, to call it lack of a better term, it's psychological as much as it is anything else. He's not the boogeyman who you can shoot six times and nothing's going to happen to him necessarily. He's not a you know. He's not the horror bad guy as an as a indestructible monster. He is someone who who winds up killing his his victims more through psychological means than anything else. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's an archetype that you can see kind of as a through line through a lot of modern horror bad guys. One thing Freddy seems to have a little bit in common with Universal Monsters is uh, his scars from come from a vigilante justice, right? Don't the parents gang up on him and yes. kind of chase him into a burning building or something like that? They burn uh, the building down with him in it. Okay. Yeah. So like uh, Frankenstein's monster, you can kind of imagine him being pursued by this mob and therefore they're whether it seems whether it is motivated by uh, a personal tragedy or not, it's still mob justice. And so he kind of exists almost as the uh, product of the sins of the society that he lives inside of, even though he, he himself is definitely. <laughs> no. Yeah. He's, right. he's, not, he's not innocent. So um, I remember seeing this in the theater and Holy smokes, this feels close as close as I can read kind of imagine to what I must have been like to go see um, a universal horror film or something in the movie theater, because the, all the teenagers who were out on Friday night seeing, seeing this film were just like alternately um, jumping in their seat after the jump scare or laughing after I'm your boyfriend now happens and the tongue comes out of the, <laughs> the receiver. Right. But it does support your point of Wes Craven and Sam Raimi all understand that comedy and horror both, create and release tension and one comes often after you get scared you jump and then you laugh because it's like the same thing basically it's the other side of the coin of right of, of laughter that's a fun choice that's a fun choice and our there's a, a jackie earl haley was kind of the second freddy and i he's such a good performer it's a shame that that uh, didn't take off yeah it's also interesting that robert england was known for being a good guy type character Type mm-hmm. actor. I mean, most of you knew him. You knew him from V. Yeah. So he was definitely playing against type whenever he stepped into the Freddy Krueger role. Yeah. Okay. okay here's the thing. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I wish I could show you the notes I wrote because oh, wow. <laughs> I had Freddy and I said almost the exact same words about how iconic and how it's so impressive that you see one thing a hat, a sweater the glove Mm -hmm. and you know exactly who it is immediately. And there's so much to be said about that. Oh yeah. You know, Jeff, it's always a bummer when we have a guest on and then they, they are basically can out duel you immediately. And you're like, okay, well I'm done for this show. (laughs) Welcome Dawn, new member. I'll see you guys later. It's been a great four and a half years. No, but I don't know what happens now because one of my characters. Oh, that's uh, perfectly fine. If you guys choose the same thing, that that's that's awesome. That means brilliant minds are thinking alike. No, okay, I'll add. what you said was almost verbatim what I had written. So I was sitting here going, "Oh my gosh, this is crazy." Yeah. But, so what do you, what do you like about uh, why would you have chosen uh, Freddy Krueger, Don? Because of the iconic uh, yes, clothing yeah. and the yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are few movies where you see one piece of clothing or one prop or something, and you know exactly, and it's not just us, it's everybody, you know? Yeah. And I just think that that's really impressive. Yeah. It's funny with uh, 
Bela Lugosi, I imagine at the time of uh, the Dracula um, films coming out, uh, maybe one in three or four Americans may have owned a uh, tuxedo and a kind of some kind of exotic European medallion or something like that. <laughs> but uh, I, it might have been greater that uh, a sweater, a striped sweater, hey, half, half the dudes in the, in the U.S. probably had one of those. So yeah. it is kind of funny that that the uh, the the wardrobe supervisor on these films were like, well, why don't we give him a nice sweater? <laughs> I think he's probably the only horror character who wears a sweater. Okay, uh, Don, what would a what's another choice that you have that is not Freddy Krueger, but it's one of your four? Okay, so Ash Williams, Evil Dead, right? Because yeah. This guy, I swear to God, he gets his ass kicked worse than any character ever, all time. Like, he beats himself up. His friends beat him up. Like, he's so bloody. He cuts his own hand off. Like, come on. <laughs> There's just no one who has suffered more than Ash, to be yeah. honest. And I just love that movie. Well, both of I, I actually think I like Evil Dead 2 more than the first one. But... You know, and I know it was early, mid-80s, but I feel like the graphics were so far ahead of their time, even though you watch them now. I mean, obviously now things are $200 million movies and whatnot, and they probably made Evil Dead with a dollar, or I don't know what their budget was, but I mean, those graphics are so good. Just even the camera moving through the woods, like all, I just love those movies so much. Oh yeah, totally, totally agree. I love that you picked a person who is, he is, he becomes possessed. So he's a, he's a, he's a, an evil character at some points, but he's essentially the protagonist. But the question was horror movie characters. So, and he's a classic one yeah. for sure. It does feel like what if the three stooges and, uh, and, uh, you know, like a classic horror film kind of had a baby. That's what the evil right. dead feels like. <laughs> When he's punching himself in the face. Oh, yeah. yes. It's so slapstick. That's uh, It's also true that I think like the uh, the movie The Road Warrior, it's essentially a remake of the first film plus money, like uh, mm. Ma Mad Max yeah. and The Road Warrior. Kind of the, <laughs> kind of yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Well, in the scenes where he gets his ass kicked, they go on forever. Like, even you're exhausted watching it. You're like, come on. He can't go through any more. Come mm -hmm. on. But he does. It yeah. never stops. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, I uh, think this too, this too goes back to your the, the thing you mentioned earlier about like the, you know, the connection between comedy and horror or comedy and, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being scared is the same sort of um, kind of, uh, kind of release. And it's like, you kind of wish there were more horror comedies, uh, kind of more along the lines of what they used to do with, you know, Abbott and Costello meet the Wolfman or, you know, what? let's get like the guys from Step Brothers meet like La Lorna, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Get, the, get something get something new involved instead of, um, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's maybe it's – is that uh, – whether we've mentioned it or not, uh, Dawn works for a large entertainment company that has a number of horror franchises as well. But uh, although I don't know how much you're in marketing, but I imagine it's kind of hard these days to, to market something that strides, uh, straddles genres, right? So uh, comedy, horror, it's almost like you got to pick one or the other yeah. when you go to market. Movies mostly stay in their lane, which, I mean, I don't know. I love the comedy horror genre like Shaun of the Dead all of those I mean I I love that genre so I wish that we would see more of those types of movies yeah I would also uh speaking of a genre it almost seems like uh the evil dead was the progenitor or or an extender of the cabin in the cabin in the woods uh, oh. subgenre of horror um and I obviously it's uh, was it Night of the Living Dead was a cabin in the woods. So there's a lot of things that uh, start with um, start with that cabin, and we figure out what evil stuff could happen there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. So guys, um, let's do one of your choices before we go to halftime, shall we? Okay. Okay. Uh, our second pick is um, 
the Brundle Fly from the 1986 remake of The Fly. Oh, that's where fun. Um, Jeff Goldblum uh, plays Seth Brundle. He's this kind of uh, enigmatic um, uh, scientist who's created this teleportation technology that's kind of like on the verge of um, taking taking shape into being this new thing, but he doesn't. It's not quite right. And um, kind of like all like classic mad scientists, he takes it too far. He goes a little too quickly with it, and of course, he gets fused with the this um, kind of nascent fly that flies into this teleporter with him, and their genes mix, and he moves from one pod to another, and they he's now been turned into like this um, this com- combined monster. But what's what's amazing about this? character is that it's like this slow transformation over the course of the film it's not just he's a human fly like um in uh uh like the wolfman or something he doesn't just it's he's just not like the wolfman or, or the fly or something like that he's like it's just this horrific body horror of his fingernails start falling off or he first starts feeling like super strong and confident and has this tremendous appetite like um physically and sexually and just then his ears start falling off and his face starts changing and he's he's just disgusting by the end and he just turns into this living fly but then kind of you know like in a dracula sense his you know his uh his girlfriend the um the character played um by gina davis is like she loves him in spite of how monstrous he is and um you know there's dracula kind of mix attraction but and with this guy it's the same thing you have this tremendous sympathy and pity for this person even though he's done it to himself but at the same time um you know she's the one that pulls the trigger at the end blowing his face apart and it's just like she has to because he's this monster now and like in spite of in spite of who he could have been he's he's not that person mm-hmm. won, won the oscar for best makeup oh cool yeah, that, that transformation. Um, I, I well, Jeff Goldblum already has a little bit of a creepiness about him. Like he mm-hmm. he's such a lanky. Right. In, in, I wouldn't say he's insectoid or anything like that. Like uh, Don, you know, or anybody could kind of remark on whether whether he has a relative amount of attractiveness or something like that. But uh, um, yeah, the 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 character that he turns into uh, feels like something as Cronenberg usually does that feels like something that is a nightmare that I would have. I would have a nightmare where I, I'm in school or in the office or something and my, my toenails start coming off or my, my hair on my face yeah. starts growing out and I can't do anything about it. So uh, it feels very relatable. Very relatable. That's a fun choice. Always, the, like horror and like science fiction and like have always kind of gone hand in hand of like the human being that isn't quite human anymore, whether it's like, you know, via magic i guess that's not quite science but like you know magic with the wolfman or like you know gilman from the creature from the black lagoon being like this piece of science that's kind of evaded humanity for thousands of years or you know before mentioned frankenstein's monster it's just there's something that is horrific about all of these things of a human body transformed into something you don't quite recognize yeah and i think i think he falls right in line with that sort of um that sort of uh, creature that is just horrible to look at and to think about. To, mm-hmm. to, you I know, it's always it's, it's fun to. F- you feel like what? <laughs> I Go feel ahead, that no. way about my body lately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what am I transforming into? <laughs> that's that's what I've have learned about aging is uh, I I'm not losing my hair. I'm just going through a hair relocation process. It's gone. It's gone from the top of my head to the to my back and Ooh. other other undecorous places. So. Uh, so we're going to go into our halftime, but uh, we're going to spend a lot of that uh, inviting you not just to go out to the Mount Rushmore podcast uh, uh, website on the Internet or the social media sites on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook um, or downloading past episodes and rating and review them or wherever you get podcasts. But to go to ClassicHorrorShop.com uh, and buy early, buy often, and you can uh, uh, support that buying habit by using the discount code MR. 2020 
uh, which will get you 10% off until November 1st on a minimum purchase of 25 bucks. Does that include shipping, Dawn? Is that- no, and okay. that was something that you just made me think of. You know, the post office, not to their fault, is not doing the greatest job lately. So yeah. I suggest ordering things that you want for Halloween earlier than you normally would because things... Some packages have taken, you know, five or six weeks if it's first class mail. It is free shipping over a hundred dollars though. And if it's not wildly expensive, I try to ship priority when I can, just because of the, the issues with the post office lately. Ah, uh, right on. So uh thank you so much for offering that discount. MR twenty twenty uh gets you ten percent off a uh, purchase of twenty five dollars or more up through November first. So here's the deal. You can also do some very practical shopping. Uh, it's not just the fun extra stuff, because uh, we all have these necessities, right? There's there's uh, bath products. We all got a shower, right? And there's also some really cool masks. Could you describe some of the? Uh, obviously, you got Jason masks and uh, things like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, we have all the typical like we me. I have all the typical like Jason, um, Freddy, Chucky. Uh, I'm looking right now. I actually have an Ash mask in stock right now. Um, and it's one of the possessed ones, so he looks really cool. But uh, chin, chin, chin sold separately, by the way. <laughs> if chins could, if chins could talk. Uh, so yeah, so um, there, there's uh, so much cool stuff out here, and I just want to remind you that I'll I'll say it that we use support classichorrorshop.com. Hey, you're doing uh, um, your Halloween shopping they're going to do anyway. You're supporting a small business person. An individual happens to be disabled and is hire other, hiring, hiring other otherly abled individuals to work in the shop too. So uh, you're doing a lot of good by supporting um, ClassicHorrorShop.com. And it got us a cool guest. Uh, Dawn is very knowledgeable about this topic. That happens to be the Mount Rushmore of new classic horror characters so uh hey, hey jeff before yeah, we can before we continue yeah i just want to jump in real quick and make a little correction did it because if it sounded like that i got confused about whether or not it was wes craven or tobe hooper who directed poltergeist oh. it's because i had a brain fart oh okay yeah. so just just making sure we don't get yelled at about that online by any of any horror film fans and depending on who you talk to they'll say tobe hooper was just kind of on set and spielberg was directing. yes there's but. a little little bit of a controversy but you know who it wasn't who was that wasn't was, west craven, was, was craven. <laughs> no um oh my god okay cool so um am, am i right that there looks almost like i see a texas chainsaw massacre leatherface ornament so you can start your christmas shopping if you want to. Yeah. I it's crazy. Know. It is literally right here. And they smell so good. Not that anyone else can see, but you guys can see, and you can tell them how amazing it is. Oh, that's great. That's a leather face. What does it smell like? Blood and gore it's or like, like cinnamon? Vanilla. I vanilla. have two. <laughs> should, should smell like leather, shouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you capture that, but... <laughs> He has um, cross chainsaws in this one. That's, that's, that's cool. That's awesome. It's awesome looking. A traditional yeah. Christmas ornament right there. Um, yeah, so, okay, we are back. And, guys, you've got some catching up to do. I think you have one or two topics that you need to share to catch up to Dawn. Uh, no, you got one to catch up to Dawn. So what's your third choice? All right, so our third choice, and this was a, this was a tough one for me. I went back and forth on it a little bit and before I got a hold of Michael and he agreed with me. Uh, but it's Michael Myers. Oh, right on. An indestructible monster. Yeah. And just ask anyone who is on the set of Wayne's World, and they'll tell you what an indestructible monster <laughs> he was. The ego. No, that guy. Rich, Rich, the Richard, ego. Richard just wrote to me, Michael, and I was like, I'm in. Anytime my name, my first, <laughs> I see my first name in anything, I want that as a pick. <laughs> we're discussing a horrible monster. <laughs> a horrible monster. Yeah. And as we are talking, I happen to see Michael, Michael Myers has shown up on my Zoom screen. Oh god. Which is awesome. Oh god. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. Which something I didn't know about was that is apparently at least the original one was a uh Spock. William Sh- a William yeah. Shatner uh yeah. <laughs> mask that was just painted white and like messed up with it a little bit. Yeah, I saw those too because people take those 
and they redo them. It's pretty amazing. It's this whole culture of people that want to redo all their Myers masks. It's That's fascinating. Yes. Okay, so you're saying you sell Shatner masks that people create Myers masks from. They so, paint them and all that stuff? Yeah. Um, Richard, sorry for the tangent, but this is uh, oh, this a is rare... important. This yeah. is important. It's a 1970, I think, five. Uh, Captain yeah. Kirk. Captain Kirk, I think. And then people take these. I don't know. Can you see it? And um, yep. yes. And they redo them and turn them into the Myers mask. <laughs> but also, people buy the Myers masks and they redo them as well. It's mm -hmm. impressive. Yeah. <laughs> What film was it where they say get some Michael Myers masks and they show up with Wayne's World masks? I forget what that was. Like a heist film or something. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. That's pretty uh, funny. So, sorry. Tangent over. Uh, why did you pick Michael Myers? Because he is the, I think, the maybe the original indestructible killing machine. Yeah. In terms of, of horror movies. Uh, you know, I, I thought a lot about Jason Voorhees. And at the end of the day, I think Jason Voorhees is kind of a ripoff of Michael Myers a little hmm. bit. Sorry to say that, guys. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a little bit, let's just say imitation is the, I'll, I'll be a little nicer and say imitation is the the, the dearest form of flattery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but I, 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 in all seriousness, I think Michael Myers set the prototype for, you know, the almost supernatural being they can't mm -hmm. be killed. You can shoot them. You can drop them off a roof. You can drown them. And he still just keeps coming at you. And it's that relentlessness of seemingly never being able to defeat him mm -hmm. that I think has influenced so many other horror movie villains since then. Yeah. Well, and he came before. He was um, 1978, I believe. Yeah. So... I think the first Friday the 13th was maybe 1981. So he actually did come before Jason, but still, whoa. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, yeah. That's a fun choice. Uh, mm -hmm. The John Carpenter's ability to kind of hop into different genres and make them his own um, is, I think, often celebrated. But there was something that felt very creepy and psychological um about friday the 13th um wait am i messing, am I yeah, messing halloween. halloween uh that it just felt almost like an extension of the 60s um um psychological horror uh of like a rosemary's baby or something like that so yeah that's a that's a that's a fun pick um it also does seem like it's an extension too of the kind of the sins of this uh family and and the dark dark things that happen in suburbia and, right and the, the the horrors that could be created by them that's uh, another and that's another archetype that it kind of created was this idea that the the main bad guy well i wouldn't say created because obviously there's i think it's i think it's actually a good through line to something like psycho uh -huh. which was probably the original you know kid becomes messed up because of his screwed up mother and family and turns into a serial killer because of it Mm -hmm. I think there's a you can make a direct line between that and Michael Myers, and then it's kind of spreading out from there in terms mm -hmm. of horror movies. Yeah, it is funny that they each pick. It's not they weren't called uh, Michael Myers or uh, you know Jason Voorhees. They were taking holidays or days observed for the fright and fear and superstitious uh, that is related to them. Halloween and Friday the Thirteenth. And uh, those titles were probably what was used to sell that thing. But then these sure. guys are just these kind of iconic characters that jump jump forward and embody all the fear that we have for those days. How do those things sell on the horror shop, uh, Dawn? Oh, they do really well. I actually, well, yeah, I think Halloween and Friday the 13th are probably the two franchises that I sell the most. Um yeah, I, I, if I had to pick, I would say those two. So obviously people like the classics and I'm a huge, huge fan of classics more so than modern day horror. I just think that 
Um, I don't know. I feel like now movies are all CG and I don't know, back then they didn't have that. And so you were just scared shitless just because, you know, it wasn't all like put in on a computer. It's genuinely scary. Yeah. I don't know. There's something that's become a little bit more sophisticated. The horror genre now has A-list directors in it and um, A-list actors, because I think one of the aspects of horror that remains, but uh, is that uh, it's almost market proof. Like you can always make a horror movie and you don't need a star because all the characters are going to be killed. (laughs) So it doesn't matter whether, (laughs) whether you have Meryl Streep or Meryl Johnson, because she, she did. Uh, But the, Halloween and Friday the 13th were also, um, I remember watching them for boobies as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Didn't we all? Come yeah. on. <laughs> so that was a scintillating aspect of that genre that uh, uh, I know I enjoyed for sure. I will yeah. say, though, as a person who has misophonia, which is like the the condition, I don't know what it's called. It's a condition, I don't know, but it's where noises bother you. <laughs> Oh yeah. The makeout yeah. scenes in those movies, I have to <laughs> mute it. It drives me insane. I can't do it. <laughs> like Kevin Bacon, keep your lips to yourself. No thank you. It's like listening <laughs> sitting next to Uncle Tony while he slurps some minestrone soup and his dentures <laughs> are coming out. <laughs> like, oh, stop. Yeah, it's too much. And there's like so much of that in those movies. Uh-huh. Uh, all right, Don, what is your final choice? Okay, my final choice is, and I'm not a huge fan of sci-fi or that genre or alien movies or any of that, but this one falls in a category all of its own. Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Sure. Wow. Okay, educate me on this because I've never seen this. Oh my gosh. Okay, it's like mid-80s and... They are killer clowns from outer space and they come down to earth to capture people. And the way that they do that is they have these cool ray guns and they turn people into cotton candy cocoons and then they suck (laughs) their brains out. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Uh, It's so good. As if uh, people needed a nudge to be afraid of clowns. Uh, this, (laughs) This helps. What no. do you enjoy about it? Is, is it the humor aspects? Of it, it, it sounds like it's very imaginative, too. It's not scary. Oh, my gosh. The sets are amazing. Like, just everything about this movie, especially for the mid-'80s, is amazing. Like, if you guys haven't seen it, you have to. And I recommend it. If anybody has not seen it, it's so good. And they put it up on uh, Netli- uh, Netflix in April. So I think you can still watch it on Netflix. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, am I allowed to plug that? Whoops. <laughs> sure. Hey, why not? Why not? <laughs> Too late. <laughs> you've got you've got a lot of homework if you haven't seen classic uh, horror films, uh, listeners. This a uh, lot of lot of recommendations from us. All it's right, so, guys. This one character, Shorty, right? I love him because he's tiny. He's actually short, which is why he's Shorty. But um, there's this one scene, and I don't want to ruin it for anyone, so I won't because it's very likely that a lot of people haven't seen it yet, but I want them to. And there's this scene with these bikers and he uppercuts one of them and he's, you know, half his size. And it's just so good. I have either of you guys seen it. No. Yes. I, yes, I have. Okay. So a long time ago, a long time ago. Oh, I've seen maybe it. you don't remember then, but yeah, there's that one scene. And a fact that I actually just learned two days ago was that, Shorty, so none of the clowns were named, which is interesting. Uh, They don't speak, so they didn't really, I guess, feel like they needed to give them names. But so they actually named Shorty Tiny, but then um, the fans started calling him Shorty, and so now he's Shorty. And he was the only one that they gave a name to, and then it didn't stick anyways. (laughs) Uh, Were were you to go to classichorrorshop.com, uh, they have a shorty costume. Um, I don't know how many sizes it comes in. But it's a, like it's, a one size. It's an adult. Yeah. And the masks, for some reason, I guess, are stuck in customs. So I actually don't have the masks. But I oh. have two other characters. <laughs> I don't know 
yeah, that's <laughs> always challenging. There's like typhoons in China and I, it's, it's been an interesting year. <laughs> yeah. I would say go to classic uh, dot com. If not for the good deals with your uh, discount code of MR2020 for the great photography, because we see, uh, we see Shorty and other killer clowns threatening a child, I think, in one of these photos. Yeah, so. yeah we did that shoot at the old L.A. Zoo. <laughs> That's horrifying. <laughs> That's horrifying. <laughs> I try my best. I try my best to, uh, to create <laughs> nightmares. Um, okay, all right, guys. Uh, you know, as, as it sometimes happens, we give a topic – that you guys may be knowledgeable at, but our expert uh, guest is really, really, really expert and knowledgeable at. So you're kind of getting trounced around the playing field here. But you do have one last choice to make a choice that's going to stand out. What do you got? I I got it. I got it. You got (laughs) this. Uh, It's uh, the girl from The Ring, Samara, from the 2002 um, film of the same name, um, where... She is this vengeful ghost from the grave. I guess all ghosts are from the grave, or maybe not. I, maybe they're just a ghost. I don't know. No grave involved. Never mind. She's not a ghost from the <laughs> Okay, she was grave. cremated. She, oh, she was in a she's well. She's a ghost. Yeah. She's okay. a ghost from the well. Yeah. It's kind of a well. A well could be a grave. Sure. A um, watery who grave. Has, um, yeah, a watery grave. There you go. She has um, somehow uh, cursed this video cassette with um, this promise of revenge if to have for whoever watches it um, seven days later, they'll die in this horrific death. Um, and what I find so striking about her or just that I like the idea of this revenge and revenge from the grave, almost like something out of um, um, something viral and something out of like the mummy where uh, someone who has been wronged has come back to uh, impact the living you know, almost just because like they are only there to um, they're so they're disembodied in a certain sense. And the way that it is, she is portrayed with just this soaking wet kind of, you know, um, uh, this character just with long wet hair crawling out of a TV set is so frightening uh, just as an image. And to, to watch this thing, I, I didn't see it in the theaters, but I remember first watching it at home. And it, you just feel like you're there yeah. in that moment. And you can imagine this hellish ghost creature crawling out of your own television. Mm-hmm. And I think that the, there's something with all, like all of our picks, every, all of our picks have all of these visually striking elements to it. And, you know, she crawls out of almost this black and white image, like something crawling out of the past as well. Um, if it was kind of coming in full color, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't quite feel Right. It would feel too normal. But I think it being in black and white harkens back to kind of a classic horror element. That's the same way you see, like, saw the original Dracula and Frankenstein. And she feels like this black and white character, revenge character come to life. Yeah, that's a cool, cool pick. I remember being watching it in broad daylight on a VHS cassette (laughs) or or DVD and being still terrified (laughs) by this movie. Um, John, do you, is, is, is that, uh, would that have been one of your picks? And and that is a Japanese film that has, I think, think nicely translated to, to the U S market. Yeah. I think that's one of the better newer horror films. I, um, like I said, I'm always a fan of the classics and there are some exceptions. And I think that that is one of them. Um, you know, I do like, I do like too, that she, as a character, she's not killed. There's no way to really defeat her. Um, she's just kind of exists to curse again. And I think the, like the end of the film is kind of left with these characters in a, kind of a, this moral dilemma where I guess if you make a copy of the tape, it kind of puts it off. It puts the curse off into someone else. So you're kind of, she's morally compromised you, even though that that might not have been intention. There's, you know, horror films often have like this kind of survivalist nature to mm-hmm. them. And Hey, if it's not, if it didn't kill me this time, it's going to kill somebody else. And I have to live with that guilt, but at least I'm still alive. But she's, you know, She's out there and she's going to kill again. It's just, you just don't know when. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I definitely like that part of it. But I enjoy, you know, movies like Saw and, and things, which is kind of the similar, you know, make decisions and mm -hmm. it could affect you, it could affect someone else. You know, I love that dilemma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a uh, it's finding the evil that exists in all of us. Um, it's kind of like Facebook. It kind of breeds off the evil <laughs> that comes <laughs> that exists in all of us. Definitely. I would say the uh, there is a fun genre. I don't know if it was after the uh, advent kind of of electronic communication in terms of email or obviously like phones and things like that, but uh, when uh, films are made based on urban legend and, and that kind of lore. I think of something like Candyman that had at its core an urban legend. Um, mm -hmm. And this one too, it seems like uh, it's something that is spread through technology and uh, is kind of hard to uh, put back in the box once it comes out. So that is a, seems like a very contemporary aspect of the horror genre. The dealing with urban legend which spreads often through technology and then the villain travels travels through technology um super cool super cool yeah i wouldn't have picked the ring but it's a good pick so i support it the only other thing i could think of quickly outside of freddy because um we all agreed on that one is because who doesn't want a murderous baby gage from pet cemetery okay okay tell me more about that tell me tell me about gage Gage likes to chop Achilles tendons from under the bed. I am a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I am in. That is like, yeah. I am not one of those people who, um, though, you know, they they can't put their feet on the floor next to the bed. <laughs> yeah. As much horror as I watch, I'm still like not affected. You're and, not affected. That's crazy. No. You can just kind of put it put it away into that uh, yeah. the dark dark recess of your brain. And it's ninety percent of my viewing, so I don't know. But yeah, Pet Cemetery, that first one, oh my gosh, so good. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, he. And again, I don't want to ruin these in case someone hasn't seen it and they want to see it. Um, but he gets possessed in a way. He's I don't know two or three years old. And he becomes a little murderer. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. All right. So in just a second, we're going to have one last plug for classichorrorshop.com. But after we do, I'm going to ask you guys for a non-classic horror character. Something you saw and you were like, meh, no, don't care about it. Not interested. Uh, but uh, I want to invite you to go to classichorrorshop.com. And please do it before November 1st because that's when your MR2020, Mount Rushmore 2020, 2020 code expires uh, on November 1st. And that code gets you 10% off any purchase of $25 or more at classichorrorshop.com. This is a small business run by a, a very awesome individual by uh, Don Gearlinks. And uh, buy early because the post office is doing their best, but they're understaffed and, and the government's coming in and taking all their machinery. Um, and... Uh, Small details. Small details. And and you get to celebrate more when you get your stuff early. Halloween's getting bigger and bigger every year. So, uh, uh, Michael and uh, Richard, is there any horror character that you were like, nah, not into it? Not a classic. <sighs> not a classic. Chucky, no? Yeah, I think so. You know, you know my, my um, I think my 12th or 13th birthday, um, I got a bunch of kids together and we went to go see Child's Play 2 over at the um, Century 7 over in North Hollywood. Yeah. So Chucky, Chucky has a special place in my heart. Although I guess I would love to see like a team up of like um, Chucky meets uh, the Annabelle doll. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, need uh, one of, we need one of those. Uh, I, I guess I wasn't too big a fan of um, – uh, the Baba Duke. It, it that movie oh. and that character didn't do anything for me. I agree. Yes. I was not scared. I was just kind of like, I agree. Mm, whatever. And so many people love that movie, and I didn't I get, get it. it. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. The monster in uh, Throw Mama from the Train scared me. Oh, that was a person. <laughs> that was a that's Ruth <laughs> Gordon. Or no, what's her name? <laughs> um, what's uh, what's funny about the era that we're in right now is the real monsters are scarier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. There's this thing. There's this thing called Mitch McConnell that they show on TV. Uh, yeah. Like, oh. 
And the missing uh, link between man and frog has finally been yeah, found. Yeah. Turtle. So Dawn, for you, you uh, any character you were like, meh, not into well, it. Well, the Babadook, but um, there was a movie that everyone loved, and it's not necessarily a character, but I thought it was the dumbest maybe horror movie that I've seen. It follows. Oh, okay. I've heard, I heard kind of raved about that. Everybody. It was so dumb. Uh-huh. Is is that uh, trying to introduce a little bit of uh, um, kind of uh, when I think of like the, the superhero genre, um, they're no longer just superhero movies. There are thrillers, there are rom coms, there are um, espionage things, you know. Uh, and it seems like horror is, is as a genre, A list directors are getting in there and trying to turn turn it into a little dress it up a little bit. Um, and that maybe that happened to that movie. So it took itself too seriously. Yeah, I don't think that was it. I mean, I it seemed relatively low budget, and um, it was more the storyline. The story just didn't do it for me. And again, I hate ruining things, so I don't want to say why or it would give away the plot. But yeah. just the the premise of the movie and and the way that you got infected or possessed was it was just outlandish yeah <laughs> it was uh, through kind of a uh, sexual interaction i think correct yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i don't uh, know it just didn't <laughs> and uh, i hate like i hate even talking shit about movies because i know how much hard work goes into them but for me that one just missed the mark yeah well this has been a fun topic in a way i kind of feel like uh we we are um Bradley Whitford and Richard Jenkins and the staff of the uh, organization in Cabin in the Woods, where they get to kind of have the board up there and they pick their favorite uh, murderous characters and what they uh, that they hope will be the undoing of the the innocents who uh, college students who go to the cabin. So this has been a lot of fun, and I, I'm really excited because for once in a while, a long while, Michael and Richard are coming out of here with a point. So congrats, Michael and Richard, on Freddy Krueger. Yeah, good job. Um, oh, so, you, so does so does Don. She gets well, that's what I was going to say. You, you got it because she got it. So congrats, Don, mm-hmm. on Freddy Krueger and three more points in terms of uh, uh, what I'm saying is you won, Don. You won. Um, Yay! Yes, we're going to go with all four of yours and one of theirs. It's on the Mount Rushmore Wednesday, Adams, and you know, let's hear it for the ladies out there uh, coming out and kicking ass. Um, yeah. Freddy Krueger, obviously uh, a great uh, kind of protagonist for classic character in Ash Williams from The Evil Dead, and Shorty and Company, sorry, Tiny and Company from Killer Clowns from Outer Space. So, uh, cool. That uh, we know Killer Clowns is on Netflix. Um, so go out and try to stream all those other titles. And while you do, you could probably cuddle up to a, a, a plush Freddy Krueger or something. And what do they sell? Do you still do you sell plush characters at ClassicHorrorShop.com? I have probably like ten to twelve different characters. They're super cute. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm a fan of giving babies things that they don't realize are murderers <laughs> or like we like. I have a Beetlejuice one or you know Chucky. It's perfect. Please buy them all and put them in your baby's cribs and send me pictures. Yes, yes. And you get you can uh, wait till they're older and they can ask their parents, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, that's how I ended up like this. I watched this stuff way too young, and here we are today. Here we are. Here we are. Uh, there's a Chia Pet, a Pennywise Chia Pet. There's a lot of fun stuff there. Oh, my God, that thing is so cool. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> I encourage you to go out and support uh, small businesses throughout the holiday season, kicking off here with Halloween. Yeah. Uh, because uh, these folks don't have the big franchise behind them. They're out kind of earning their dollar every day and actually living from year to year. And this is the season uh, for companies that um, are serving the uh, horror fans out there. This is the season for them to make a little bit of money. There are so many so, so, so many good um, handmade products out there for Halloween, but also as Christmas gifts, too. So I fully recommend checking out and finding some of these smaller stores, you know, that that um, artists and any of that kind of stuff, crafts, um, 
also bath products. I know I sell some, but I still support other companies that are small businesses as well, even if they send, sell the same types of things that I do. Right on. Cool. So thank you, Dawn, so much for being a guest on our show. Really appreciate it. And uh, so this has been our kickoff to the Halloween holiday part of the season, the Mount Rushmore of the new classic horror characters. I, as always, am Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael. 